people. We are now recording, ladies and gentlemen. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So the basic assumption of this model is that, the, that you get a whip by multiplying a radial drift speed times the parallel confinement time. And you get a similar scaling for magnetic and E cross B radial drifts. So originally, this was specifically a low gas puff uh, model, and it's in the title, the name of the 2010, 2011, I guess it is, paper. Um, and it, it did something a little curious. It assumes sheaf-like losses from the scrape-off layer, where tau parallel was set to 2L parallel over C sound. Um, and then wow. it, um, uh, we also assumed, which is a little contradictory, but, but actually you'll see it's not so bad. We also assume that the upstream temperature was determined by spitzer harm thermal conductivity because the target temperature to the seven halves was much less than the upstream temperature to the seven halves, which is what comes into spitzer harm uh, upstream temperature determination. Um, and so sort of this thing, the C sound has a T to the one half and this has a T to the seven halves. And sort of the T to the seventh difference is what makes this slightly weird combination work. And it did work. So these are odd bed fellows, but they but they worked well for experimental conditions. And we'll see there, there's not a problem with them theoretically either. Um, and so what happened is that what was coming out uh, in the early 2010s was high quality infrared measurements of diverter target heat flux, um, which were coming out much narrower than they'd been before. Uh, and but these were only available under low gas puff conditions. If you started getting a fair bit of radiation near the X point, it, you got some infrared and it messed up the measurements. So this was all explicitly low gas puff conditions and it worked pretty well. So here is the result of that model. If you just take those, that model that I said, um, you would get two A over R rho poloidal. That's what you get from multiplying the average radial drift times the C sound that I showed you. Um, uh, 1.6 A over R rho poloidal is what fits the data better. So basically you take that model I just showed you in, you know, it's a really simple model and, you know, the data are like 25% lower than that. And so uh, we're going to have an emotional fit over 25%. I don't think so. So it's an extremely simple model uh, and it's uh, not a bad fit. It's sort of within 25% over an order of magnitude range. Um, so it's, Kind of, it was kind of reasonable as a way to think about this problem. Uh, we'll go one more step and we'll look at the, at the scaling coefficients. Um, so the first one here, the first box that doesn't have any error bars on it, and there's a zero here, are the scalings from the heuristic drift model. And then you could take uh, either the standard talk max at fixed aspect ratio, in which case you didn't get a prediction for the aspect ratio scaling, or you could throw in mass or mass plus NSTX uh, and you know the uh, the B scaling and the Q cylindrical scaling, the the power scaling, uh, most importantly the size scaling um, with zero here. But all of these are consistent with zero size scaling, and the aspect ratio scaling. You know those big big error bars. Um, but the but the point is the key practical result, and we're not going to get into the practicalities here. But the but the key practical uh, depressing result is that the scrape off width does not vary with system size. Anybody who was reasonable had thought that um, there's some chi parallel, there's some chi perp. And if you have a longer length in the perpendicular direction, you're gonna get longer time in the system and you're gonna get a longer width in the parallel direction, uh, in the cross field direction. Uh, but that did not, that just plain out isn't right. Flat out ain't right. Um, you know, if you do bone perpendicular diffusion, you don't get the right answer. Um, so this has got two negative things, two unpleasant things. Um, so the scrape off width is being narrow means there's a very high heat flux into the diverter because the heat is in a very narrow layer, even in a gigantic machine. Uh, and it predicts like one to two millimeters in ether, um, maybe more like one. Uh, and then the other is that, so here we have this gigantic heat flux, but, but the other problem is that um, in that narrow layer, there's not much volume to radiate. And so it gets harder and harder to uh, get detachment. And actually, I, I won't get into it, but the latest detachment results are also consistent with this, that, that, it, that as you go up in, if you go um, up in current and therefore down in this, this scaling result, go down in the, uh, in the um, scrape off width, 
uh, it, you need more impurities to get detachment. So higher current, less, narrower scrape off width, less volume to radiate, more impurities needed. So um, this is in the spirit of what Harold Firth used to call my confinement scaling. It's the goal, another Goldston catastrophe. But we'll move. We'll, we'll, we'll leave that aside and go into physics. So this model, however, fails at high collisionality. And the first results came from H.J. Sun, called by everyone at Aztecs Upgrade and now Jet Sunny, uh, and maybe sexist, I don't know. But anyhow, she found that um, at higher collisionalities, uh, she was just measuring the upstream electron temperature with Thomson scattering. But in principle, uh, you know, if you believe uh, Spitzer conductivity, uh, the width of the scrape off layer and the temperature is going to tell you something about the width of the scrape off layer in power. And it just got a whole lot wider as you went up in collisionality to, to the, these particularly well detached conditions. So, um, so this was a hint that there was something more to be figured out. Uh, so let's do it. So we're, we're going to take this heuristic, heuristic drift model and we're going to generalize it versus collisionality. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're not going to say that the upstream temperature uh, is just given by Spitzer conductivity and the heck with this piece. I just told you we were the original version forgot that piece. Let's put it back in. Um, and the other thing we're going to do is uh, we are going to include radiated power uh, near the diverter target. So whatever the upstream Q parallel is, it gets reduced by the presence of radiated power. Uh, but then this is the standard uh, near the target. Uh, this is the, the gamma that has to do with C sound times density times uh, C sound times uh, density times temperature. That's the rate at which heat uh, shows up at the target. And so the Q parallel reduced by the radiated power near the target uh, has to be uh, carried into the target at the sound speed. So that's the usual boundary condition at the target, um, including this power loss. Um, so a key parameter that we need for this is some sort of a tau -E, um, some sort of a tau -E that I can multiply times the drift speed. And so I, I haven't seen this in the literature, uh, but it's an interesting thing. If you take the upstream, if you take the upstream pressure, um, I've got T and EV, so that's why this E is here. Uh, and then you say, well, I've got some area and, and some length, uh, some length. And then I divide by Q divided by area, uh, power divided by area, I get Q parallel. And so this is the uh, energy confinement time. It's, there's a three here because it's three halves and then the half goes away because I'm including the ions and the electrons. Um, so this is, this is like an object and it uh, hasn't gotten attention as far as I can tell in the whole scrape off layer world, uh, but I needed it. And so you've, it turns out you've got enough pieces here uh, you, um, that you can just turn the crank and you know, fiddle around as usual. And lo and behold, you get a, a, a nonlinear equation that you can, you know, can solve numerically or you can, plot, you can plot it in various ways so you can do it. Um, you get a, uh, an enhancement factor over this sheath limited value. And in particular, if you go to low collisionality, so this is make this a low collisionality, um, then uh, this, this term doesn't go, go to zero, but this term has to go to zero, go to F power equals zero, like the original model that says that tau E prime is one, which is to say that you have no enhancement. This is that you get right back to the, um, uh, to the HD model, to the low collisionality HD model. So that's encouraging. At least the picture hangs together. And there it is. Um, so there's this eta parameter. When you, when you turn the crank, you get a lot of stuff. And so this, is the, uh, this has got to do with the sound speed. And this is the, the function of Z effective that goes into thermal conductivity. And, and nobody gets this right. I don't know why nobody did this. But this is a simple fit to the, uh, to the, the, the four different numbers that you, that you get from the um, numerical calculations. And, you know, it's no big problem to put that in, but it, it is not linear and z-effective, and it's not, you know, uh, sub, you know, z-effective plus four over five. This is what it is. And then this is the standard new star that, um, that Stangby uses. So here's new star, and here's some stuff. And um, you can see that, that um, and the, the range of collisionality that most of the experiments are in is sort of here. 
And so you can see that, yeah, you know, it's not perfectly flat, but you know, we, if you really wanted to go from 0.9 to 1.1, uh, you'd have to go quite a distance along here in collisionality, a region that people don't really access. And then there's also the fact that as the radiated power gets greater, which was going to tend to happen with more density, which is this way, um, you know, it's going to pull you down a little bit. So, um, you know, the original model, it's not too surprising that it was, it did pretty well. And it, it and yet it it's a little surprising in a way that it, it worked with these two opposite limits. Um, but there's another effect, uh, which, is, uh, which is that um, the poloidal gyro radius, which is uh, uh, proportional to V drift over C sound, um, if you just you know, grind through the numbers a little bit, um, it's also affected. Um, and what's going on there is that if I have at low collisionality, that other effect was a high collisionality effect, right? At low collisionality, that was the thermal resistance due to collisions along the field lines. At low collisionality, you have a high T target. And when you have a high T target, everything else being equal, if it gets high enough, you'll eventually have a high upstream T, and then you'll have a fast drift. And the drift goes like uh, t, like t, and the sound speed goes like t to the one half, and so you get a t to the one half kind of effect on on this number, which is important. Or you get it; you can think of it as being on the poloidal gyro radius. Um, and so, you know, if you go to extraordinarily low collisionalities, you can get uh, some effect here. For sort of again, for the normal range, it's it's you know it's less than a ten percent effect. And, and it also is one of these uh, nonlinear equations. It's easy enough to solve, um, but there it is. And um, you can put them together. Uh, this was part of what my student did is he, he worked on a self-consistent way to put these together. And the, um, you know, so at low, so, and, and now we expressed it here in terms of the separatrix density compared to the green wall density uh, for asdex like parameters. And the dots, he did a nice little calculation of where's the minimum. Uh, and anyway, so the gist of it is that, uh, yeah, you can, you know, if you go to extremely low collision, look, NSEP over N Greenwall to 0.1 is sort of insanely low. And NSEP over N Greenwall to 0.6 is kind of insanely high. And so, you know, uh, that's the, the, the flat point is in the middle, and they throw on 10 or 20% radiated power, and you're really back home where you started. Uh, so, um, a little bit surprisingly, you, you get back to the old result, but you do have something very different at high densities. And you really, it's very hard to access this region. So this, you, you're, you're, you're not likely to see this, uh, but, but it's nice to be complete. And, um, and this part is important. This part, as we'll see, is important. So we have a, now a generalized version of the heuristic drift model. How well does it do? Um, oh, well, let's say, what is it doing? On the far right, um, we've got this collisional effect. The thermal resistance affects how we parallel. There's a, a temperature drop along the field line that's important. Um, and, and that's getting to be quite significant up here um, above NSEP over N Greenwald to 0.6, which is a pretty big number. This is the edge in you know, the separate extensity. Um, and then uh, down here, we have this, this strong sheath limited effect where the target temperature affects the upstream temperature. And so I'm multiplying the drift speed times tau e, that's the model. And so when you multiply these two together, you get the increase in the, in the drift speed compared to the sound speed as it works out. And here you get the increase uh, in, in tau e parallel. So, so okay. we have, a, we have a little question for you here. Sure. And at what point, I mean, at what point in the high density regime do you run into the density limit right if, which is of course it's not going to be a simple relation but you're headed there right it's hard yep. to, you know okay well I, I, what i'll get you to is a prediction about the h to l back transition okay okay that's where we're headed um yeah. okay and there's the hd model and you know it's not a surprise you know it's 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 not inconsistent that in the in the range where we were typically operating, which was typically sort of from point, you know, I don't know, 0.5 was high uh, for us, and 0.2 was you know lowish. So you know, this is this is the range we're basically operating in for the separate extension. Um, so it's not too surprising that it, that it still works, but then it's interesting to 
to chase out the implications of this. And I got started being interested in that. And, uh, and Andrew was like, yeah, let's dig into this. Let's see where this goes. So we tried out different things. Well, actually, I'm sorry. The first thing we did is we checked whether it fit with the Aztecs upgrade data. And roughly speaking, it looks like you can't, even in the L mode, um, you know, it, it seems to sort of put a, a limit uh, on, uh, on the uh, scrape off width. Uh, here's H mode data, it's sort of beginning to tail up here. Here's some I mode data. Uh, the H mode data at the same collisionality is lower, the H mode data is lower than the L mode data. And so I'm not claiming this explains the L mode, uh, but you, you can see that there's a tendency even in the H mode to get wider here. Um, and this is what I showed you before. These are all the parameters I showed you before. This is, um, so how do you deal with the fact you've got a finite width scrape off layer and it's got a collisionality that varies across it. So what collisionality should I use? Uh, what we chose to use is a Q parallel weighted radially averaged collisionality. And, um, you know, we pulled that out of a hat. You had to choose something. It certainly didn't make any sense to use the lowest collisionality right exactly at the separatrix. Um, and so this is, this is what we chose. Uh, but you know, you could certainly uh, argue with it. Um, so what are, what are the implications of, of this uh, for shear flow stabilization of scrape off layer interchange turbulence? So we looked at, could this stabilize drift waves? Could this stabilize ballooning modes? Um, you know, we, 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 we didn't find anything that, that immediately grabbed us, but we, we started looking at the shearing rate that you predict from this. I've got a scrape off width. Um, and so if I can get up, if I can figure out the potential and I can take its second derivative, um, I can do a shearing rate in the scrape off layer. So it's the shearing rate in the scrape off layer. You could argue maybe the shearing rate across the separatrix is what's interesting. That's somewhat bigger, uh, depending on how you, what width you choose uh, for the distance over which the shearing is happening. Um, and then there is the standard uh, interchange growth rate. So how do these compare? Um, and or, or, well, I guess I'm gonna talk about theory for a moment first. So there were simulations done with this GBS code by Halpern and Riki, that's how you pronounce it, um, in nuclear fusion that we dug up. And lo and behold, um, they have these parameters here, boy, do not try to figure out, or, or at least, you know, get yourself a, a good cup of tea while you sit down and try to figure out the normalizations in this, this uh, GBS code. These are in GBS coordinates and, and, you know, Y is rho star to the minus one, you know, I don't know. I dug it through and yes, uh, this omega E cross B is actually this. Uh, and um, this, uh, this, he calls it gamma B, but it's the interchange growth rate, it's, it's this. Um, and what he found in his turbulence code is that um, just outside the separatrix, uh, he got a nice high omega E cross B that was greater than the interchange growth rate. And he got a change in the quality of the turbulence there. Now he didn't go as far as I'm about to go, but um, what he said was, um, oh, I'm gone somewhere else, I'm sorry. Um, so let, let me go back. So, so this region where the shearing rate is greater than the interchange growth rate is in the near scrape off layer region of inner wall limited TCV plasmas. That's what he's looking at. And as I'll show you in the next slide, in this region, lambda Q looks like the HD prediction. So it's, it, it, it's suggesting that the, that the H mode type HD calculation uh, is appropriate in this regime where the shearing rate is greater than the interchange growth rate. Um, so we're going to hypothesize, going a little further than uh, Halpern and Riki, we're going to hypothesize here that the H mode in diverter plasmas requires the shearing rate of order the interchange growth rate. Was uh, the if I could if was the Halpern sure. calculation linear or nonlinear? Nonlinear. So, I mean, how much of a fluctuation reduction did they get in the region of interest? Um, if you can figure that out from his paper, you're a better man than I. He, 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 sort of, he, he sort of jumps into his theoretical interpretation without showing you the turbulence level from the code. 
And I suppose he didn't he didn't show the reduction in the turbulent flux either. Um, he shows the theory for it, but not the ex well. I mean, maybe I'm being unfair. Um, uh, it, it's it's I would let me be let me backtrack and say I think the right thing to do is for you to take a look at the, at his paper and see what you think. And but I can't resist another question. I mean, right. how many how many sort of mode widths across is that region? You know, in terms of say scales of the interchange. Well, um, where you get the reduction, right? It's um, that's comparable to the to the um, that region is comparable in width to the scrape off layer. Okay, it really, if that's if that's what you're looking for. Well, close enough. Thanks. Um, and so here is here are these results. I mean, this was a really interesting thing. We did all this work with all these different machines who did inner law limited operation. And they, and they uh, looked at this sort of a, a near scrape off layer and the, uh, a near scrape off layer where it's very, very steep and then a, a further out scrape off layer that is broad. And in the design of both the jet and the eater, because eater just does whatever jet did, um, inner wall bumper limiters, um, they assumed that it was like the broad scrape off layer. Uh, but in, in fact, when you measured the heat flux on the inner wall, there was a very narrow initial scrape off layer uh, that as it turned out, um, here is the HD model and here's this 0.8, right? This, this is the 1.6 uh, factor instead of two. And there is the data and somewhere in here is TCV, uh, but this is the JET and CMOD and uh, there was some nice D3D probe res results that, uh, that um, uh, Stangby did. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of scatter, but it's, it's again, you know, got down to millimeters, you know, a millimeter on CMOD at high field, as usual. Um, it was the same size as the HD model uh, prediction. And, you know, it's like, right, we could overlay this on that other plot. And so what seems to be going on in this case is that this narrow scrape off layer region is similar to the HD model, similar to what we think we see in the H mode. And and it also correlates with, at least in this, that simulation, it correlates with the um, growth rate of the interchange mode being less than the shearing rate. So I think I saw, uh, I see Eda here, but I thought I saw one of the fathers of this whole theory, but I guess too much. Uh, but, uh, anyway, so the interchange, so, so there's another paper so this was great. I gave this. I gave a talk at the ITPA, and Krasheninikov, whom I can't imitate, just trashed me. He said, "You know, this is incorrect. You can't make this assumption. It's got nothing to do with blah 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 blah." And and but with a very heavy, you know, I can't do. I can't do. Uh, I can't do Krasheninikov. But he's he's good-hearted, and I said, "Okay, let's go take a look at your paper. You're telling me your paper is completely disagrees with me." Um, okay, so we went back and looked at Zhang Krasheninikov and Smolyakov together. And it was a paper, you know, I shouldn't feel that bad that I had missed a 2019 paper. Uh, but in any event, um, here it was. Here was, um, you know, the, the interchange growth rate depends on K theta times the uh, radial mode width. And if you have a high enough K, if you have a uh, low enough K theta, then it drops off. Um, but anyway, the, here is the, the standard interchange growth, width, growth rate. And what they had done is they, they varied omega S over gamma int up from zero to 0.2 to 0.4, and they didn't have a plot for less than point for the shearing rate greater than 0.4. And 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 then in one of the uh, in a there were sort of two oops there were sort of two different papers, and a different paper showed you the the mode structure at this point, and you're like well that looks like it's tearing itself apart, and so after a fair bit of discussion, it turns out they don't they couldn't find an interchange eigen mode. For omega s of, of the, for the shearing rate over the interchange growth rate greater than 0.4, and so, you know, I was a liar for the fact that yes, I should have chosen 0.4 instead of one. I don't know, but it but it does seem like there's decent theoretical basis for thinking that somewhere around omega shear over uh, gamma int of one of or unity, uh, that things are really going to happen to the interchange mode. So um, here are Aztec's upgrade data. And I'm going to argue that they support this role of omega s over gamma int. 
So these are time dependent data um, from, um, uh, from uh, shots, um, some lower power shots and some higher power shots um, where they vary the density in time. And as you can see, and these are L modes, and these are um, L modes here, and then there are ones with sort of an L mode point somewhere here, and then it drops into a disruption because it's pretty high density. Um, anyway, um, it very rapidly, let's see what I say here. Okay, so what, what is this plot? What, is, what are these data? Because um, this actually doesn't have anything to do at this instant with the, um, with the GHD model. This is just flat out data. But what kind of data is it? So um, we, we used a two-point model on ZOTS for the upstream potential due to Stangby and Schenken and nuclear fusion 96. And, and there, that, that on ZOTS that you can see there, that shearing rate, I get from his potential and then a lambda t to lambda t e squared. Uh, and, and then this is his potential compared to the temperature. And there's some part from the upstream temperature minus the target temperature, and then another part uh, that stands alone with the, um, yeah, the, the, the target temperature over here. Um, and this comes from, yeah, you, you don't know the density profile. You do know that in the limit of Spitzer conductivity, you do know the temperature profile along the field line. And what they did is they assumed that the density profile was proportional to the temperature profile to some power. You had to choose something. And it doesn't make that much difference. It makes some. Uh, but you could get the you could get this thing this t tar then you then but then it depended on the target temperature and you could get that from the two point model using the upstream Thompson scattering data. Now this model assumes j parallel of zero, which is not really so good for very low densities. Maybe this point has to do with that. I don't know, but at very low densities, um, uh, you can get a very significant j parallel, which will which reduces the upstream potential. Um, and connects, it carries current from the outer diverter to the inner diverter. Um, and, and gamma interchange, you, you know, Thompson scattering data just hands it to you, right? It's just a pressure gradient uh, and a major radius. And so you've got a sound speed. And so you've got all that from the upstream Thompson scattering data. So this is just data um, analyzed this way, um, to be clear. Um, uh, but what happens is that given this, the data done this way, um, you know, which I guess you can argue with, and I, and I do argue with with whether how good it is in this low end, really. Um, but anyway, um, and these are, I believe, the lowest density cases. Um, it seems like the H mode kind of snaps in to this very narrow scrape off layer, which corresponds, therefore, to a very large omega s because of this lambda t squared here. Uh, which, if this gets narrow, this gets small, right? So that this gets big. Um, and then it slowly degrades until it falls out of the H mode into, the, uh, into some L mode and then ultimately disruptions in some cases. Um, so this sort of feels qualitatively reasonable. Um, and it also has this feature that, you know, if you were to take Zhang, Krashininikov, and Smolyakov for, for real, I, mean, I don't know, you guys, they're part of the SoCal crowd, I would think. So you guys should be proud of them. Anyway. If you were to take them, take them at face value, there it is. I'm, I, I think, um, you know, I'm not going to, you know, say it isn't 0.8 or, you know, I don't know how accurate this simple model is, uh, but um, it does give you a strong feeling that the, the very, the, the, uh, the very high shearing rate uh, could be um, correlated with staying in the H mode. So now I can't, oh, actually, let me go back to this plot. I can, I, can I harass you again since you opened, made it open season? Absolutely, I, mean, that, I love harassment. It's much that, better than just babbling on. Right. I mean, I mean. Anyway, say, I, you know, I think Sergey's not here, so I have, you know, maybe I should harass you with a Russian accent, but I don't. Please. Think so. uh, but uh, you know that jump, of course, on the left-hand side of the curve looks. That looks like a bifurcation. Right? Oh yeah. What what's going on is really not a shift in growth rate uh, or something. It's a transport bifurcation, right? And so the question is, uh, we need an S curve, right? And have you set about 
trying to construct a model like that and to isolate the bifurcation point. And there's no, the question of the correspondence of the bifurcation point with the linear growth rate criterion has not always borne out, as you well know. Well, so what, what I'm arguing is, um, actually, let me, I think my wife is playing some nice music downstairs. Um, uh, what, what I'm arguing is that, okay, and, and I'll, first thing I want to say about this plot, why I came back to it, is I'm not, I really can't from the GHD model make an argument about the left-hand side. The problem is that the GHD model isn't relevant to these conditions. These are L nodes, which I showed you, give you a you know, different scrape off width than the, um, uh, than the H mode. Um, and the H mode is what the GHD model is relevant to. So I can talk about this side, logically, logically, I can talk about this side. Logically, the GHD model can't talk about this side, but of course I don't have the GHD model on this page. So what do I, what do I think about this snapping in? I do think it's a bifurcation. The most obvious bifurcation is that um, you apparently put in, um, you, you, once the L mode, let's put it this way, once the L mode which, whose transport I personally don't understand. And I think nobody really understands the outer region transport in the L mode. Um, it, for example, doesn't seem to match the turbulence uh, predictions. Um, when, when it gets to the point that the scrape off layer just barely gets thin enough that it can turn off the turbulence in the edge, then, it, then the scrape off layer gets thinner yet and it just takes off. So the bifurcation comes through the fact that the electric field shear scales as one over lambda squared, while the growth rate scales as one, I guess, one over lambda. Actually, that's lambda really, the one half. Well, lambda the one half, yeah. That, so that's really the gist of it then. Yeah, yeah, that's the gist of it. Um, and it, you know, in, in the experimental observation, you, you sort of feels right in the sense that a thing snaps into the H mode, but it sort of dribbles out of the H mode. And so it's, it's a different, the, this, this, as you go up in density. And so this, uh, and, and, and it's, it is dribbling down in omega S over gamma ant. Um, you know, why this is a so big a jump. One thing that um, Ike says to me is that the time windows where he takes the Thompson are preset. And so, the Thompson window that includes the falling out of the H mode is a mess. And so what he really needs to do is set the Thompson averaging to either side of the H mode transition. And so he's kind of missing a point somewhere here. Anyway, snaps in decays slowly. Um, looks like the, it, somehow the L mode gets to a place where it's got enough shearing rate that it just turns off that thing and it boom, it gets more and more shearing rate. Right, and as it narrows up, Right, and as it narrows up, the shearing rate grows compared to the interchange growth rate like, um, like lambda to the three halves, the ratio does. So it turns out that on ASDEX, they had done some, uh, this um, Bernard, I had Matthias Bernard, or his PhD, had done a bunch of work on H to L, so that's what I'm interested in. That's the thing I can maybe predict with the GHD model because I have a, a model for the um, H mode um, scrape off width, uh, including collisionality. So as it gets more collisional, it gets um, broader and broader, and then maybe it snaps out of it, out of the H mode, falls out of the H mode rather. Um, so he had some separate power scalings and actually what he had was he had it sort of backwards. He had a different way. He expressed the threshold in terms of density versus everything else, but I just inverted it to be seem more natural to think of it as a power scaling, but it's just mathematically equivalent. Um, so the um, GHD model gives you, you know, uh, power goes like n to the alpha, q to the beta, bt to the gamma. Um, and so here's the set, the scaling with n, q, and bt. And um, so a little subtlety here is that at this time, they didn't have separatrix uh, this time, well, actually, his thesis is a little before then, of course. They didn't have uh, Thompson scattering at the separatrix. They only had what they called the H5 uh, density. And that's line averaged over the outer region of the plasma. It's, it's really more like the um, pedestal density, pedestal top density 
than the separator density. So it's likely to skew the scaling. So let's be a little careful. Um, but you know, we got the sort of general gist of the density scaling, um, the, at least the right direction and general gist of the Q scaling. And then, then there was just this wild thing from the GHD model where the where you had a negative scaling uh, with the magnetic field that it took less, you know, PSEP right at the H to L transition had a negative BT scaling. Whereas we know that the standard, um, uh, the standard L to H mode scaling has a positive BT scaling. And son of a bitch, uh, Bernard also had a negative BT scaling. So that was a little surprising, kind of encouraging in a way in terms of understanding this. Um, so the GHD captures the general trends, um, including the negative power scaling with BT. So that's a, that's a little encouraging. Um, and so now let's look at it. Here is a bunch of L modes that ultimately disrupt. So these are, these are all L modes that don't have enough power to get into the H mode. And here they are in the H mode. Those are the H modes. Um, here are a bunch of H modes um, where they've got lots of power. Um, but they're disruptions and then falling out of the H mode here along this line. Um, what else do I want to say? This is this is a narrow range in field. They didn't. He also didn't want. The, there's some funny things at low density uh, that we're not including, um, and uh, it's a very narrow range in field and in current, uh, and it's just ASDEX upgrade. So with all those caveats, if you if you were to take Kreshnikov at his word and draw the the line. It's sort of, you know, does a pretty damn good job um, that in terms of distinguishing between the, the sort of upper limit in density that you can get to while still staying in the H mode. Um, and this is all separate tricks density. Um, so it's, it's not the same uh, as the line average density that you would think of in the Greenwald limit. Um, so that's, uh, you know, the, 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 another thing, though, to, that's worth noting is that um, where this GHD model starts to broaden is, a, is dependent on collisionality. And so if you had a different model where you said, oh, gee, all that matters is collisionality, um, then, you know, you're not going to be too far from, a, from this kind of a slope either. So it's, um, it may be hard to distinguish whether it's just somehow collisionality and, and collisionality does play a role in the trade-off in the core region of the plasma or just inside the separate tricks on, um, as we know, on um, um, uh, drift waves versus interchange modes. But here, this is a different model. This is a model that says that what's going on is the shearing rate in that outer region. You know, I think there were some results from TechStore that, uh, sorry, text, pardon me, that also looked at uh, shearing rate. I haven't been able to dig them up or I haven't dug them up. Um, anyway, another interesting thing is that confinement improves as you push up the shearing rate. Uh, I'm sort of arguing that um, this is a case of the tail wags the dog, um, that it could be that the interchange turbulence at the edge uh, in, in the scrape off layer, the interchange turbulence in the scrape off layer could be that the interchange turbulence in the scrape off layer creates a turbulent enough region in the edge uh, that it, it depresses, uh, it broadens the scrape off layer, it therefore depresses the edge temperature uh, and it, it seeds uh, turbulence into the core. And if I turn off that seed and if I really stomp down that seed, that, that makes the, uh, the, um, the, the uh, pedestal uh, more effective. It's as if it was the toe that counted and not the shin of, the, of that leg. So anyway, as we go up in omega s over gamma int, so these are a few, the, these lines are a few cases, and I'm just going to give you the red one. Uh, so we, we go up, we go up, we go up, confinement's improving. Over here, this is the uh, H98 factor, and here we're going up in omega s over gamma int. We, we went into the H mode somewhere around um, 0.4 here, um, and now we're up at 2. And we're, you know, for Aztecs, this is actually pretty good to be at 1.2 times uh, H mode, uh, the tungsten walls, right, everything. Um, so, uh, so on the way up, confinement improves up to about two, and then it degrades on the way down. As we go, as we go down in shearing rate uh, over gamma int, it degrades. 
and then ultimately it disrupts at the high density where the uh, where the um, yeah, omega s gamma omega shearing over gamma int is low enough, which is to say the collisionality is high enough. Um, but and so you know it might be worth going back and looking at these models that say well it's really confinement that is causing the scrape off width to be um, narrow. A good confinement causes the scrape off width to be narrow. Again, it could be, and, and, and it's very hard to make these models be general, uh, but in specific areas, you know, you look at specific cases, you can sort of see the pattern, but it, it, it doesn't really scale from machine to machine. Um, anyway, but, but it could be that what's going on again is the tails wagging the dog, that it's the narrow scrape off layer that's giving the high shearing rate that is stabilizing the, uh, the, the uh, and, and potentiating uh, the rise up. Uh, to the H1 pedestal. And so there's kind of a favorable prediction for Eater. See, I'm not only uh, uh, Robbie Downer. So I've got something positive to say once. Uh, so here is the here is the Aztec's upgrade, shearing rate versus interchange rate versus separate tricks divided by Greenwald density. And um, 10 megawatts uh, of scrape off of, of separate tricks power is kind of a real good day for Aztecs. And so if we compare the interchange growth rate here, I'm sorry, the shearing rate here uh, with the interchange growth rate, which is this guy, they cross each other at about NCEP over N Greenwald at 0.5. And this is this is getting to where it's kind of hard to hold on to the H mode in, in Aztecs. So this is this is, well, as you saw in the other plot, it's reasonable. If you want 0.4, uh, then that's you know, that's just here. A little bit higher. Um, but for ITER, um, 50 megawatts into the scrape off layer is pretty easy to do uh, because you've got 150 megawatts of heating. And you know you're gonna have some, uh, you are gonna have some, um, you're gonna have some core radiation from Bremsstrahlen and stuff. But but this is this this is really, you know, not a hard job on, on ITER to put 50 megawatts into the scrape off layer. And then um, to get these two lines to meet, you're at 0.9. So it could be, it, it's, it's within the realm of possibility, or at least it's predicted here, let's say, you heard it here first, that um, the separate extensity, which is what matters for, for example, getting um, radiated power losses so that you can uh, take power away from the diverter target. It goes like separate extensity over Greenwald squared. So, you know, there's a lot to be said for 0.9 versus 0.5. Um, you know, you're gonna four times less impurities than you thought you were gonna need. Uh, that's that's worth uh, taking to the bank. And then the other thing is that it's got a pretty gigantic omega um, S over gamma int in the sort of mid range here. And it's it's twice, if twice is what's good for you, um, that goes way up to pretty high NCEP over N Greenwald. So it could be that this shearing rate, that, that, the, that the, the fact that the scrape off layer uh, is so narrow, which you know made you annoyed because it gave you a high Q parallel and made you annoyed because you didn't have so much volume, um, you didn't have so much volume to radiate. Uh, maybe it's going to make you happy on Aztec on, on Eater because it um, allows such an extreme shearing rate uh, to uh, to chop off any turbulence that's trying to stick its nose out across the separate tricks. Um, so in conclusion, or, or said another way, it, it, it prevents any turbulence in the outer region from sticking its nose in. Um, the HD model can be generalized to lower and higher collisionality. Um, at high collisionality, it predicts lambda Q to grow about like experiment. Um, Aztec's upgrade data shows a strong correlation. You know, I, I, I told you how I got to these numbers of uh, this with H versus L mode. Um, it's consistent with the theory for interchange stabilization with two different looks at that. Um, the GHD model predicts uh, PSEP versus NSEP uh, for the, so the power, remember that, that, that plot with all the gold colored H modes, the left-hand axis was the power and the horizontal axis was the separate tricks density. And it, you know, doesn't do too badly on predicting that. Um, Although, you know, it's also, since it's so tied to this place where the GHD model rises up, which is tied to collisionality, it's also tied to collisionality. A high shearing rate over uh, interchange growth rate seems to correlate with improved confinement. 
Um, this model predicts a high shearing rate over interchange uh, growth rate at a high NCEP over N Greenwald for eaters. So that's nice. I can go to a higher NCEP over N Greenwald uh, before I get to the density limit of the H mode, and I can go to a higher, a pretty high one uh, and still have very good confinement, it looks like. Uh, there's more work to be done, clearly, varying parameters in Aztec's upgrade. I don't quite understand how Bernard got a wide range in currents and fields when it seems to be hard to convince them to go to higher or lower uh, currents, um, particularly higher currents because disruptions are nasty. But it would be nice to do some more bearing of parameters in Aztec's upgrade. It would be nice to get data from JET, maybe JT60SA one of these days. Um, uh, also, it'd be good to do direct probe measurements of the shearing rate, which you can, you know, you can measure the potential. And so you can measure the shearing rate and the interchange growth rate. Uh, and um, they're actually working on that at, at Aztecs. So that is what I have to offer. And I think it's, it's worth at least considering the possibility that the tail is wagging the dog instead of the other way around. George. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let's give Rob a virtual applause for the talk. And we already have some questions. So if you have questions, raise your hand. I'm not sure who, the way I'm showing it, we have George, Tynan, Edison, and Lothar. And I'm gonna get, get in line too, but go ahead, George. So Rob, interesting talk. Um, it's, it, if I'm understanding the, the basic physics, the shearing rate, <clears throat> pardon me, just out in the scrape off layer is set by the temperature profile and the sheath physics, um, assuming a well-attached plasma to a conducting target plate. Um, I, I think well, that's in some ways it's omega a, shear, right? Well, in some ways it's actually a, um, uh, a non-conducting target plate. It's okay. not allowing any J parallel. In that, in that particular model from Stangby and- um, Okay, because that's I, my question, maybe maybe you just answered the question then. I was just wondering if you go to a fully detached uh, diverter target where <laughs> the plasma, you have a neutral gas uh, between the plasma and the, and the material target, does that change anything or does, that, uh, does the model hold in that case? So, but if J parallel truly is zero in the model, then, then of course it, it, it does work. So is that the case? Well, well, that, well that, it, it could fail in other ways, but it, it's not failing because of the J parallel equals zero. Yeah. In, okay. in general, what you see in these tokamaks is that it, at, 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 and, and I consult, I confirm this with uh, the Aztecs guys, that you see a very low current on the diverter plate at higher densities. I mean, essentially it's, it's, a, it's a temperature driven, you know, you got a battery, you've got a higher temperature at the, at the outer diverter than at the inner diverter. And so that's driving a, a thermoelectric current. Uh, but once they're both pretty low, then you don't get much current. Uh, but if they if they both detach, um, the, does the does the omega shear change? Um, I think not. I think it would be okay because it's 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 what it's doing is um, if you go back to the model, um, you know this is uh, where is it? No, no, let's see. I got to oh, now. This is annoying. Sorry. It's the, it's where I, yeah, this one. Okay, so um, there's a sheath drop of three T target, but if T right. target is zero, then so what? And then, and then there's a T upstream minus T target. And this is the, this is the piece that's just the parallel physics of, uh, if you have zero current, this is balancing the two different terms in the Braginsky equation. Okay. Yeah, I think that answers it then. Okay. All right. Okay, Ida-san, please. Hi, Ida. Hi, uh, interesting talk, and it is a very interesting uh, idea um, to discuss the uh, turbulence at the square here uh, to reduce or to enhance the um, D4D length. And in general, the E cross B shear has uh, two effects. One is suppression of the local turbulence that is a kind of the local uh, suppression. And the other is the uh, E cross B shear um, affects the uh, turbulence, so-called the turbulence splitting. In other words, suppress the uh, turbulence uh, splitting. And in your model, you have discussed the uh, more local effect 
the uh, compared with the uh, gamma interchange and the omega s. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea of how the uh, turbulence uh, splitting uh, chain affect to the uh, turbulence in the scrape of layer? Is there any idea to model the turbulence uh, splitting? Well, I don't, I don't have a specific idea to model the turbulence spreading. I know that it's a concept and I sort of used it in the talk, which is that if you, my, my thinking is that if you have an, a scrape off layer that is terribly interchange unstable, it's going to be, uh, I think I use the word, uh, I don't know what your word I use, but the, 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 the noise is gonna seed turbulence further in. That's the word I use. So it's like a turbulence spreading. I'm, I'm sort of depending, the, the sort of, um, getting to the idea that this is helping the H mode depends on a, a, depends in a way on, on the turbulence spreading kind of concept. So yes, I think it, I, I, I don't have a numer I don't have a specific model for it, but I am sort of suggesting that the reason this could have an effect on the core is and not just on itself is that uh, is a turbulence spreading kind of an argument. Okay. Uh there is no much experimental result, but we also have some uh, turbulence splitting in RHD and also uh, uh, the experiment uh, turbulence splitting to the magnetic island or scrape layer may mm. give us some uh, hint of the modeling of the turbulence splitting in uh, scrape of layer turbulence. Mm. Great. I look forward to seeing, you know, some, something I could, I could, I mean, we could, we could put into a model here. Okay, next, I have some comments on that, but I'll save them. Lothar has been waiting. Yeah, I've been talking a little bit with Lothar. Yeah, so, we, we had a discussion, we dropped the ball a little bit, I think, but very interesting uh, talk, very interesting results, Rob. Um, one thing regarding, I, I two questions, one regarding the interchange growth rate, because there are some H-mode scraper flares that are really narrow, um, one way to, to check whether this really scales as interchange would be maybe to incorporate the finite Lama radius effects into the growth rate because you have only a couple Lama radius across in some cases, right? Because um, that is on the order of a millimeter and in, in, for example, in D3D with hot ions, it can be more than that. Um, so that, that, that there should be definitely FLR effects that would affect the growth rate and that may give another handle on the scaling there. Well, let me let me push back on that. Um, the the whole model, the whole HD, the original HD model is a poloidal gyro. You know, is a number of poloidal gyro radii. So mm -hmm. it, it's going to always it, 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 that's going to be that could be important, but I think it's sort of equally important all the time because the scrape off width goes with the poloidal gyro radius. Right, the, the scaling is already in, but just in terms of the instability physics, what you use for, for the suppression criterion or... Oh, right. Uh, yeah, it comes it, in there also, right? So, right. And if, the growth rate is, if the growth rate is heavily influenced by FLR, you, you get a very different response, so... Yeah, it, yeah, it could be, yes, it could be different. And, and, and what we know is that it's, uh, it, it's about, uh, well, I guess it's about half of a poloidal gyro radius. Mm -hmm. Is a over R, a over R is one third, and it's one point six over 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 three. So it's a whole lot like one half of a poloidal gyro radius. Mm -hmm. And a poloidal gyro radius is, of course, significantly bigger. It might be five times bigger than a than a regular gyro radius, five or ten times bigger than a regular right. gyro radius. Yeah, that's about a centimeter. Or so yeah, yeah. So the the, the other question was, um, I think, looking at the the. The turbulence ballistics in the in the back transition, which we have mm -hmm. tried only a little bit, uh, would be really interesting because the the forward transition clearly happens inside because uh, you you can see localized turbulence separation up to a couple of centimeters inside the separatrix in some cases. It can either go in or out. It can start at the separatrix or it can start on the other side. But typically, the turbulence in the scraper flare is not suppressed as early as the um, the point where the dynamics get started, which is inside, right? So what we could do is now in the back transition, reconstruct that response. It's a little harder because the density is so high that makes it much harder for the diagnostics, but that mm. would be an interesting way to look at it, I think, mm. to see whether the, the ballistics is reverse, the reverse of the forward transition. Yeah, actually there's an interesting, in terms of probes, we had the, the interesting insight uh, for um, Aztecs, 
that these H modes are going to be a challenge for probes, right? We've got whatever five megawatts coming out for the scrape off layer. Uh, but, but these, and, and um, by going to low field, they even got um, omic H modes and with a density limit, you know, and so you could study this back transition with a lot less damage to probes than you could study these back transitions. Yeah, it would have to be microwave techniques for the for the for the back transition. There's there's no way, especially with neutral beam heated plasmas. Yeah, but no you, but, but omic that. ones maybe can be done with probes. Yeah, the omic. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, right. Thanks. Okay, so, thank you. I got a few comments and a few questions. I mean, first comment is your criterion is probably an overestimate, and that may be buried in the point four, because I mean, there are many familiar effects that stay, you know, that knock down the interchange. I think, you know, there's the whole, the sheath boundary condition thing, and there's also the, uh, a better bet than FLR would be finite banana. I mean, you know, you're the guy preaching drifts, right? So mm -hmm. that, that becomes a very, a very uh, significant effect. The second point relates, comment relates to EDASON. I mean, you know, other people are thinking about turbulence spreading uh, then uh, as well. And there's the question, of course, you're saying the tail wags the dog, but if you had a, for example, a turbulent pedestal or a grassy elming pedestal, the dog might be wagging the tail and the total drive in the turbulence uh, the total drive in the scrape off layer would no longer be the local stability. It would really be in a sense, the competition between the shearing and the penetration from turbulence spreading from the core. Yeah, oh, I think I'm for wondering sure. if you have a comment on that. Sure, for sure. There, there are these regimes, these grassy elm regimes that um, who's working on? Feitch, I think is working on at Aztecs. And uh, they found regimes with very broad scrape off layers and uh, lots of grassy or, you know, almost, they call it continuous kind of elms. Uh, and yeah, that's something different. I think when you, if you have enough MHD activity, ballooning type, type of activity, uh, or if it's ballooning, or I think they're, they're collisional enough that it's ballooning. It's not, it's not, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not tearing mode, not um, peeling modes. So I think it's ballooning, and um, yeah, if you've got enough of that, if the if the pedestal itself is now going crazy, uh, it's it's it it does seem to affect this the scrape off layer. I mean, and, it's and that's, that's, added, that's at a density where already this the, you know your your this is getting to be pretty small. Okay, the other thing you know you mentioned back transitions, which is good, but you know we've we've learned a lot about the LH transition over the years by stringing it out, right? These slow forward transitions and I phases and in all the games with the limit cycles have revealed right. a great deal. So it begs the question, what do we know about the evolution of the scrape off layer during all this? In other words, it would be, in other words, if there was a very, this is a challenge to the experimentalists, right? If there was a very precise local measurement of what's going on outside the separatrix, but close during the, uh, during the LCO or the I phase, it would be interesting, I think, on the, the tail and the dog, et cetera. Yep. Yeah, the, the modulation is just not very large. <clears throat> so the, the, the ER modulation and the density, uh, uh, am the fluctuation amplitude modulation is maximum inside and then it's less um, pronounced in the scrape of layer. As far as we can see, we cannot see that far out, only yeah. a couple millimeters, but that should maybe be enough, so. Perhaps that is supporting the, the dog wagging the tail. I mean, would be one cynical rejoinder, so. On the way up, yeah. Yeah, on the way up, yes. I mean, on the way down is interesting, so. All right, any other questions? Uh, the other fluctuation person from D3B, Dr. McKee, please. Yeah, a few non-UC people snuck in here, but uh, that's, that's Pat's fault. 
Uh, so very nice talk, Rob. Uh, question. So this may be disease of coming out of TTF going on this week, but uh, we've been talking isotopes. Isotopes. And, um, in fact, uh, had a very nice talk from LHD this morning. I uh, just giving credit to Tanaka-san for either to hear, but uh, actually it was yesterday morning. But how does that come through? I see a lot of uh, sound speeds and gyro radii and row S. So do you, are you going to get some benefit here, even if it's modest, uh, going to going from hydrogen to deuterium and ultimately to DT in terms you know, of the straight off layer width? You know, all of this data are deuteria, are, are deuterium. Mm -hmm. And so these comparisons with Aztecs are all deuterium plasmas. Um, the, you know, now that I think of it, I think we did, I think, <laughs> I don't remember whether we put tritia, whether we, you know, just turned the knob up for, to 2.5 for the uh, uh, mass ratio in the, um, uh, in the eat, that eater plot I showed you. I just don't know. Mm -hmm. And I haven't looked at it. Okay. So I, can't, I, I, I think the answer is I haven't got it. I mean, I could try to speculate, but I, I you know, it's, it's in too many places. I'd have to do it there uh, carefully. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 don't, I don't have an answer about what the implications would be of the different species. I and mean, we know that, um, you know, that hydrogen H modes are pretty unpleasant. Hard to get, yes. Yeah, and when you get okay, up, well, we'll let you. So you know, on that, on that, on that, on the, on the, on the, the theory of uh, linear continuation, or uh, you know, whatever, extrapolating into the complex plane, you know, go if, if hydrogen is worse, then maybe tritium is better. But that's not um, that's not science necessarily. Particularly because I don't I don't know that, that this whole business it, it, I, I just haven't looked at this whole business and I don't I'm not a, I think experimentally nobody's really done all this it's hard it's hard to do those experiments when you, do, you tend to not do them in hydrogen. Well, there must be some for um, there should be there, there were some that were done for ITER. Um, I don't know that they had separatrix density. So part of part of what's nice here is a good a good diagnostic for the separatrix density. That's tricky. Okay. Well, we did do some experiments, but we haven't analyzed them yet. So we'll uh, we'll get back to you. This would be hydrogen versus deuterium. So I see. Okay. it was all new stuff. Oh, cool. Okay. I, it wasn't a tricky question. It's not like I know the answer. We don't know it yet. So. Oh. But very good. Thanks. Yeah, it'd be great if I made a prediction, though. You see. Now I can wait until you give me the answer, and then I can predict it. Uh, now we're going to keep it quiet until we hear your answer. <laughs> Actually, all, all the formulae are there. You know, it's not like I get to change the formulae. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, we had a. I saw the the other George was uh, had his hand up. One one George triggers the other. The, the, or did you retreat, um, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, given the time, I'll I'll uh, I'll hold off. I have I, in, in my in my class this semester. I have two Henrys, and I take the point of view that you can't induce anything unless you have at least two Henrys. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the optim. Um, it's bad the that we actually understand the joke. So. <laughs> I was about to say the the negative predictions have stopped, but the bad jokes continue. <laughs> yes, uh, they persist. <laughs> All right, I, maybe maybe yeah, we've tortured tortured Rob enough. Unless anyone else has any further questions, it's been an epic event, an optimistic prediction. So, yep, old age. All right. Well, let's thank Rob again for a very stimulating talk. Exceedingly interesting. Right. Thank you all. It was fun talking with this you talk. Yep. Take care. And, uh, Rob, I'm going to be in touch with you about some discussions as I wrote you, right, with, with my young colleague. I, this was a bad day for you, but we'll go for next week sometime. We've, we've pursued the spreading business that Ida-san has raised uh, here in, in some depth. So okay. uh, we'll make for an interesting discussion. So. Excellent. Very good. Look forward to it. All right. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you.